Hello and welcome to the Game Ready Podcast and I have a great guest and uh, one of the most, probably one of the most intelligent doctors that I've talked to in a long time regarding, regarding using resistance training to limit and to minimize injury. Uh, Dr. Yaz is, is, is well renowned in, his, in, in, in creating the Yaz system and I'll, I'll let him tell you about his background, but everybody who wants to actually learn how to actually be more productive and actually use resistance and weightlifting to limit injury, this is the podcast for you. Go ahead, Doc. So thank you for having me, Ernest. Appreciate the opportunity to speak on this issue. I think anybody would acknowledge that chronic pain is the number one health issue affecting Americans, 130 million Americans, roughly 1 billion people worldwide. And we really need to start to get to the understanding. Some core principles have been lost over the last 40 years where the MRI began becoming the primary mechanism for diagnosing the cause of pain. We, we've lost the core principles of what science is about and how it works. So just to recap the concept, what is pain? Why does an individual get pain? They get pain because it's an indication from a tissue that's in distress to create awareness to that person that the tissue is in distress so that an intervention can be performed to resolve the distress of the tissue. So we recognize that pain is not innocuous. It's not arbitrary. It is specific to a tissue. If you get pain at your chest and your left arm, you see that as an indication of a heart attack. The heart is igniting the symptoms to make you aware that you're having distress of the heart. If you go completely numb on one side of your body, it's a symptom representative of a stroke. Your brain is igniting the symptom to let you know there's distress. So that's how the premise of pain exists. So if you have pain or dysfunction, you can't lift, bend, twist, do something, you're going to see care. Now, the goal of the care, the initial goal is to get a diagnosis, right? Yeah. We want to know what. What is the diagnosis? The purpose of the diagnosis is to first identify the tissue in distress. Mm -hmm. So we say things like you have lower back pain because you have a kidney stone. You are having dysfunction in your body because you have cirrhosis of the liver. Mm -hmm. You are having blood supply because you have mitral valve prolapse. So you can see there's a phrase with the term of a tissue in there. So we have to identify the tissue in distress. This is the part where everything came apart. Number two, mm -hmm. you must be able to show that that tissue can create the symptoms you're experiencing True. because there has to be that connection. We're acknowledging that the tissue is eliciting the symptom to create awareness of its distress. Well, if the symptoms don't match what the tissue would create, then that probably isn't the tissue creating the symptoms. Sweet. That's the problem. So when we look at the MRI, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're having lower back pain and you get an MRI and it says you have a herniated disc. Mm -hmm. Now this is kind of looking at the inside of the back, kind of right here at the top of your pelvis and here's your lower back. So let's say you were having pain right here. Oftentimes people have pain just off, two, three inches off to the side of the spine. And someone is told that this disc is creating that pain, mm -hmm. right? Well, if this were creating that pain, that would be known as referred symptoms because where you're experiencing the pain is not where the tissue is that's creating it, supposedly. Mm -hmm. It is being referred from here to here. So if I wanted to, as a practitioner, you came into me, you have pain here, I would say, well, let's see if it's referred. So what I would do is I would try to on your back, find this level, and I would press on the disc. Mm -hmm. And if I was to press on this area, I should be able to get you to say, oh my God, I just felt that shoot over to here. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you could do this from here to eternity and it's never going to happen. Wow. It will never happen. I've been doing this for 28 years. I've treated over 15,000 people, mm -hmm. right? But what if I press right here and you say, oh boy, yeah, that's the pain. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, what I just proved was that the area where I'm pressing is the area where your pain is. That's called point tender pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I can show that the, the tissue I'm pressing on is the one igniting your pain, that proves this couldn't be referred. Therefore, the presentation of your symptoms 
is not what it would have to be if the structure identified with the cause was creating symptoms. I just disproved it. It's mm-hmm. irrefutable. Mm-hmm. So you then have to go on and say, well, are you saying that I don't have a herniated disc? I'm saying, no, you do have a herniated disc. But so does 70 to 80% of the population, regardless of pain or no pain, height, eye color, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So what you have to recognize is that when you're talking about trying to resolve your pain, identifying structural variations for the sake of that will do nothing to resolve your pain. So in a sense, what happened was you were misdiagnosed. You got the wrong tissue because the two rules were not utilized. You didn't, you identified the tissue, but the symptoms you're experiencing are not what they would be if that tissue were creating the symptom. So it turns out that in like 98% of the cases I've treated, that is the rule that's broken by the use of the MRI. The symptoms people are experiencing are not where they should be if the cause of pain was the structure identified. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So I'm going to give you one more. I think we could show it here. Yeah. So if we're looking at the knee. Yeah. So let's say that you had pain around your kneecap. Oh, yeah, that's normal. Very common, right? A lot of people have pain around the kneecap. Mm -hmm. Now you get an Mm x-ray and they say, oh, boy, you have a meniscal tear. The cause of your pain is the meniscal tear identified. Yeah. Let's follow the rules and see if it matches. So number one, did they identify a tissue? Yes, a meniscus. Mm -hmm. Are the symptoms where they should be if a meniscus were to cause pain? Well, the meniscus lies between the thigh bone and lower leg bone. And there's a space between them where the meniscus lies called the joint line. Yeah. Well, I could press on the joint line, but I'm not going to get the pain because you just told me that the pain's around your kneecap. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the kneecap is actually in a separate joint. Yep. The joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. The knee is comprised of two joints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then how can a meniscal tear cause pain at a separate joint? It can't. It would be like me saying you have arthritis at the elbow and it's going to cause ankle pain. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's a separate joint. Yeah. It's a separate joint. Yeah. So again, the finding of the meniscal tear breaks the law that the tissue identified is not creating the symptom being experienced. Therefore, it cannot be the tissue in distress, even though it is a structural abnormality. Mm-hmm. So over 28 years, I've been able to show that in more than 99.999% of cases, what is being treated based on that diagnostic test is not the tissue in distress. That in fact, in almost 96 to 98 percent of the cases, it was a muscle. Wow. It was wow. a muscle. Now, so you say, oh, that sounds crazy. How, how could they be that far off? Mm-hmm. Well, I asked you this. That kneecap is having pain most likely because there's an imbalance between the front thigh muscle and the back thigh muscle. Even people who go to gym would acknowledge they love to do knee extensions. They love to do leg press. Yep but they're not so great at getting the hamstring curl in right, or or doing hip extension. So they create that imbalance. And what will happen is the quad will shorten. Mm -hmm. And because of its attachment to the kneecap, it pulls excessively up. So when you bend your knee, you get compression of the kneecap. Yes. That's what's causing your pain. Exactly. Well, does that imbalance show up on an MRI? Not at all. It'll never. Is a medical professional typically educated or trained to identify muscular causes no they're structured that's what they are taught because that's what they treat exactly exactly so that psoas muscle or that lower back muscle if that's Mm -hmm. in spasm does that show up on a diagnostic test no but the herniated disc will Mm -hmm. so if you go to an individual who primarily establishes causes based on diagnostic findings they're going to find the herniated disc. They're not going to find the psoas muscle of the QL and spasm. And so that's never going to be identified. Mm-hmm. Therefore, chronic pain is primarily the result of misdiagnosis. So you're getting treated for the herniated disc, but that lower back muscle, you never really resolve the reason for it being strained or in spasm. So it just keeps staying in spasm. Yes. Wow. wow. That's the essence of the method. Wow. That is, I mean, to me, it's, it, it, to me, it's just it's just plain knowledge because of, you know uh, you know I've, I've had several issues you know spe- specifically with my kneecaps 
Um, I, I've had micro fractures done on the back of both of my kneecaps. And that was due to the fact when I was younger, I loved to do leg extensions. I love to do leg extension. I would yeah. load up the hammer strength leg extension machine and I would do a lot of leg extensions. And over time, that ended up making my kneecaps extremely, extremely vulnerable to injury. And absolutely. And and then I, I very rarely did I work on hamstrings. I did not specifically work on hamstrings or any kind of posterior chain work growing up. I didn't really start doing that till really, really like 12 to 15 years ago. Right. And that was after I after I got the two micro fractures done on my knee and I saw some I saw the right people, somebody around your knowledge base of how strength and balances cause joint pain. And it helped me play an extra like five to six years. Yep. And you, you, you have to agree that if you're the typical 20 something year old guy yeah. and you go into the gym, you go right to the bench press. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you yeah. go right to the bench press. Very oh, yeah. few, few people are doing lat pull down with neutral bar perfectly enough exactly. to get the rhomboids and mid traps to match exactly. the chest. Exactly. So you get this massive chest and you kind of rounded shoulder oh, yeah. and the I, head's forward. I mean, you, you know, they call it the beach muscles, right? Oh, yeah. The chest and biceps, yeah. because that's what you're going to walk around and show everybody at the beach. The problem is, is that with that rounded shoulder, the shoulder blades are moving farther away from the spine. So the muscles that support the head become elongated. Exactly. They lose the ability to support the head. And in a sense, you made yourself have neck pain or headaches. Exactly. It, it's a chain reaction. And, Absolutely. I, and I, you know, I, I was lucky enough three years ago to actually attend a, a, uh, a, uh, a conference where one of the main issues was, was posterior chain neglect. And with <laughs> <ACS. Yes. laughs> right on, man. Right and, on. And, for, 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 and to put it in layman's terms, for other people to understand, basically, Nobody does any kind of strength training for the back of the body from the, from the, from the bottom, from the top of the shoulders down to the heels, that area is ignored times 10. So their suggestion, and this is something that I've implemented in my pro training program over the last three and a half years was to double up on training the posterior chain and the ratio that they suggested was two to one ratio of training, pushing movements to any pulling movements, any extension movements in the lower body always accompany two flexion movements or some sort of posterior chain work to strengthen the hamstrings and the, and the calves. So I, I'm in, I'm, you know, I, I wanted to get this message out to just everyone to understand that I totally agree that localized pain that's diagnosed usually is not the main culprit behind the pain. Usually there's a strength imbalance involved and you hit it on the head, Doc. So well, just tell people about, you know, just, you know, we, we jumped into the science part. Tell people more about your background. How did you get into this industry? How did you develop this system? Okay, so it's kind of an interesting thing and you could appreciate this. So I was the 99 pound weakling who had sand kicked in his face his entire life growing up all the way through high school, always intimidated to go to school. I always saw myself as the thinnest guy, which is funny because you actually make that up in your head. I'm sure there were other guys who was thinner than me or maybe not and more, uh, more, but I just, that's how I saw myself. So I wanted to change my and improve my self-esteem and, and make myself feel better. So I was going to lift weights. Well, from 19 to 26, I couldn't because my metabolism was so fast. Every six months, I take the weights out. I try to live for a couple of months and I just didn't seem to get anything to go. Well, finally, crazy story. I took a high school physics course mm. and literally started applying physics properties to weightlifting, force vectors. So a classic example is if people bench press, You'll hear the story. You need to bench press at different positions because you have to get all the fibers of the chest. Well, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. If you're bench pressing with a barbell or a dumbbell, gravity's pushing directly down. So that's the way the weight is pushing. The way to create the optimal force against that is to push directly up. And so therefore, the only true position to create maximal force against resistance is with the forearm perpendicular to the ground. Mm -hmm. That's it. So all the other things really are diminishing mm -hmm. the chance 
of growing because you're actually creating, if your hands are too wide, some of your force is being pushed out. That's called yep. translatory force. So you're losing the ability to push straight up. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what happened. So over the next four years, it sounds insane, but I put 40 pounds on. I went from 160 pounds to 200 pounds. Not steroid. I'm talking straight. Just Oh, weight. yeah. I've seen it. And so that was my personal life. Now, I was my first job. I was a project manager in construction. I quit that. And by the time I'm 30, I hear about this thing called physical therapy, and I'm going to get into it. So uh, I take a couple of prerequisites and I apply. Within that time frame, classic, another funny story. My father plays tennis every day on a Saturday, and every Sunday he wakes up in pain, pointed to the left, bent forward. I had just had gross anatomy, and I learned about the psoas muscle, the hip flexor muscle, and I learned that if one strained, not both, but one, it would pull you forward into the side, just the way my father was. Mm -hmm. Now, he had already been diagnosed with a herniated disc as the cause of his pain. So I said, I know I'm obviously not a medical professional. I've just literally taken a course, but I heard about this psoas muscle. Would you mind if I just try to release it and see if it changes anything? And he's like, if you could do anything to get me out of pain, this happened every week for months. Wow. So I said, okay. So I released the muscle and sure enough, he stands right up and his back pain is gone. And every weekend I keep doing it, release his hip flexor. He stands up, his pain is gone. And the both of us, have this kind of light bulb concept that, wait a second, wait a second. You've been told that a herniated disc is causing your pain and no one's denying that you don't have a herniated disc, but I keep releasing your hip flexor and your posture and your pain corrects and improves. Wow. Yeah. And this is in my, after my first semester. So I'm saying, you know what? They teach me a lot of stuff. I really am not going to accept it because it's not logical. I'm going to just wait until I get out and then I'm going to try to follow this theory. And just turns out that the last guy who I had my last affiliation with was the New York, uh, the therapist of the New York Islanders hockey team. Wow. And he, yeah. So he liked me because I was an older guy and kind of brash and I had a lot of weightlifting experience by that point. Mm -hmm. And so I go to work for him and obviously I'm scared out of my mind. It's my first job as a physical therapist. And so I go there and they're like, well, what should I do? And they're like, well, we don't really know because Steve's not around. He's the therapist with the Islanders. So do whatever you want. I'm like, you sure? I'm not going to get in trouble. They're like, listen, just do whatever. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. So that gave me literally the laboratory background wow. to test some of these theories. And it was unbelievably effective i wow. found people who were told they had meniscal tears and it turns out all they had done was strain their hamstring i could wow. literally point press on their hamstring tendon and they would go through the roof and say yeah that's it don't touch that anymore so i would strengthen the hamstring and two or three treatments they were pain free holy cow within a year and a half after that i got my own practice and that's when things really started to explode i did some local media i wrote some books i did a pbs special i've written for international magazines and so now I personally describe myself as one of the true authorities on the diagnosis and treatment of pain because my method through the interpretation of symptoms can tell you whether the pain is coming from a bone, a muscle, or a nerve because each one of them creates a specific symptom. Yes. The same cannot be said for the MRI. It cannot identify all potential causes. And if you're going to utilize something to identify the cause of pain, shouldn't it be able to identify all potential causes? Because mm -hmm. what if the cause is one of the ones that it can't identify? Mm -hmm. You will be misdiagnosed by definition. And so that's kind of the background of, of where I am and what I've done. And I just want it made available for anybody who is seeking the right path to finding an end to their pain and, and getting back to full function. You know, by the way, everyone talks about pain, 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 pain. Well, the reality is, let's say you're having knee pain and I tied you down on a couch for a year. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have knee pain. I assure you of that. <laughs> but you aren't going to have any life either. Exactly. So, so what's the point of that? Exactly. Ultimately, people are looking not just for the resolution of their pain, but the return to full function. And when you connect your symptom to dysfunction, by definition, you're describing it as a muscular cause. And those are the types of things that through the understanding of which muscles are creating the symptoms, an understanding how to do targeted progressive resistance, the ability to cause the muscle 
to adapt to more and more resistance, whether using resistance bands, machines, free mm -hmm. weights, it doesn't matter. You will get the force output of the muscle beyond the force requirements of the activities, mm -hmm. and you will be pain-free and fully functional. Very true. When you, when you apply the, the concept of targeted muscle or progressive resistance, do you, what is, what, is, what is your progression as far as load? Do you start with body weight? Or do you start with minimal weight or do you start with bands? You know, what? Yeah, that's okay. That's a good question. So let's, let's, cause there is this confusion when, when I start talking about resistance, mm -hmm. everybody's saying, tell me what the right resistance is. Well, it turns out it's really not a particular resistance. The right resistance is based on something called the perceived exertion scale. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the perceived exertion scale for people mm -hmm. that don't know says that you're going to do a bout of exercise, and then we're going to ask you, how hard was it to do it? So mm -hmm. let's say we choose you're going to do 10 repetitions. You do the 10 repetitions, and then we're going to say, how hard is it? Zero means it felt like you did nothing. Mm -hmm. 10 feels like you were going to tear a muscle. Mm -hmm. Eight feels like if I said to you, could you do an 11th or 12th? You'd say yes, but it would be hard. Mm -hmm. Five would feel like if I said, could you do 15 or 16 reps? You would say probably. Mm. So what we're looking for in how I do progressive resistance is I'm going to find the right resistance by whatever means you create the resistance where you're establishing an exertion level of eight. That basically wow. represents 80% of your maximum effort. That's what the eight represents. So what that means is that at that level, an exertion level of eight, that means you're going to be able to cause enough breakdown of muscle to grow, but with the least chance of injury. Wow. You're going to stay with that resistance level and your muscles are going to adapt and get stronger. So by definition, that same resistance level will get easier mm -hmm. yeah. until it reaches the exertion level of five, mm -hmm. which is where you say, oh, I probably could do 15 or 16. At that point, that's when we want to progress the resistance. We need to make the muscle adapt to a greater resistance so we can then again grow and get exactly. stronger. Yeah. So we take a higher level of resistance that will bring us back to the exertion level of eight. Mm -hmm. Then we stay with that resistance until the muscle adapts, feels like an exertion level of five. Mm -hmm. Then we progress the resistance again, back to eight. That cycle is what is known as progressive resistance. And that's the mechanism by which you do it. And it could be a band, it could be... Mm -hmm. And so your question was, oh, can it be just body weight? It, it, it's all dependent on the individual. Some, per, some people will have to start with their body weight. Mm -hmm. Some people will start with a, a substantial amount of weight that would consider and could be an end weight for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? It's all dependent on their strength, their force output of their muscles versus the force requirements of their activities. So there really isn't, you know, to say what's the starting resistance level, it's not so much an absolute as much as finding the resistance that you work at 80% of your maximum effort. That's how you start. Wow. That, I mean, that, but that, that, that takes some pretty, I mean, that, that takes uh, some experience and that takes a, 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 uh, an assessment that is pretty detailed. Uh, talk, could you talk about your, you know, just, just gloss over the general points of your assessment. How do you sure. come up with that, that number? Sure. So, um, so in terms of the assessments that I do, and by the way, let me just make this another point is that, um, so typically people think that treatment requires you be in person with the individual. Um, mm -hmm. so most people, I live in Jacksonville, Florida, think they're going to have to come here. So it's just, a, it's just not true. Um, so because of the fact that my books are sold by Hay House, which is a publisher, international publisher, my books are sold here, Canada, England, Australia, India, and South Africa. For years, I, uh, mm. my first uh, major book from Hay House came out in 2015. So I've had people contacting me from all over the world, and I never expected everybody to fly to Jacksonville for a few days. That's yeah. insanity. So I was doing Zoom before there was Zoom. I was actually using Skype initially, yeah. and now Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I have been for years utilizing virtual mechanisms to treat, diagnose and treat people. So the important thing to understand is for anybody anywhere in the world, if you want the YAS method, you can get it through Zoom sessions, okay? And all you'd have to do is go to my website, livewithoutpains.com to schedule it. But yeah, so 
The goal of the evaluation, the first thing you got to do is figure out, do you have a structural problem or a muscular problem? And mm -hmm. range of motion ultimately tells you that. And there's two types of range of motion, your ability to move a joint and then my ability to move the joint with you fully rested. And if there's a greater level of my ability to move you beyond the range that you can move you, you've just acknowledged you have a muscular cause for the mass, vast majority of people. This is not pain related. Pain mm -hmm. is not the indication whether you have a structural cause or a muscular cause, right? It's a question of range of motion. So for the vast majority of people have treated, in most cases, they actually had full range of motion both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if the person has enough pain and it's impeding them, that doesn't mean it's structural because I could then move you and it could go through full, which exactly. tells you your muscles are causing your pain. Okay? Exactly. So let's say we get to muscle. Muscle doesn't just elicit pain. Muscle is responsible for posture and movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say that you're having some shoulder pain wow. and I look at your posture and let's say you're having le a left shoulder pain and I notice that your shoulder is higher than the yeah. other. Mm -hmm. Well, is that to be ignored? Is that just, oh, it's just kind of coincidental? No, oh, no. No. The cause of the pain, the muscle and distress exactly. has also been responsible for the fact that that shoulder is higher than it should be. Exactly. So understanding correlations of posture or how you move your arm. So I'll show you an example. Watch. So what could happen is as this comes up, this shoulder raises more than this one as I'm going through range of motion. Again, that's a change in movement. Well, movement is the culmination of the pulls of muscles. So if I saw a change in posture and I saw a change in pulls of, uh, the, the motion that something goes through, those are all indicators of very specific muscles that may have strained. Mm -hmm. Then I can go on and muscle test them. I can press on the muscles. I can find nodding. And voila, I've established that there are specific muscles responsible for your pain. So now we're going to try to determine what the right exercises are. Now, exactly. the fitness industry has morphed from the old style 1960s, 1970s mindset of isolated strength training, mm -hmm. bicep curls, um, bench press, mm -hmm. military press to functional stuff. Yes. Uh, use the, you, you know, cling and jerk or yeah. cling and rotate or mm -hmm. bring it up out to the side over up and down. Combinations. And group combinations right now. Mm -hmm. Combinations are fabulous if all the muscles involved in the combination are strong enough exactly but if they're not you're going to compensate in how you do the combination exactly and by definition combination uh, co uh um um uh, what was the word I just said? um when you change how you do yeah what you're doing by definition that implies that some muscle is going to overwork in a way that it shouldn't compensation so you're leading to your self-straining. Big time, big time. So what I do as part of mine, let's say that we saw a particular muscle is weak. You want to understand that each muscle moves one joint in one direction. Mm -hmm. The bicep bends the elbow in one direction. Uh, the chest basically moves in this direction, right? Each muscle, the quad, as you know, does knee extension. Mm -hmm. So if you want to isolate a muscle, the form of exercise you're going to have to perform is one in which only one joint is moving in one direction while the balance of the body is stabilized. Exactly. Which allows all your energy to go towards that muscle. Mm -hmm. So that's how we establish how to do the exercise. Then finally, we apply resistance and we have the person do the 10 repetitions. And then after it, I say, so tell me, how hard would you say that is? Zero to 10? 10 yep. feels like you're going to tear a muscle. Zero is nothing. Do you think it's more like an eight? And that's how we find it, final, uh, finalize the correct resistance. And then the process begins and they go through the method. Uh, exercise is only performed three times a week. This is another fallacy that exists a lot. Listen, I'm all for maximal training and getting the most out of it. But people, and you have to have known this in your training. Oh, yeah. That doing too much too often without allowing the muscle to heal, the healing push, portion of training is equally as important as the training itself. When is everyone going to finally accept that and recognize rest exactly. is critical exactly. to the healing process? It's as important as breaking the muscle down. Exactly. So yes. if you train the muscle while it's in its healing phase, the high probability is you're going to strain it. Yeah, and you're going to injure it. Yeah, and that's absolutely that, that is one thing that I've preached from day one when I started in this industry. 
The magic happens in the recovery. Yes. Magic always happens in the recovery. Absolutely. That's, that's where the muscle adapts and that's where it gets stronger. And it's taken, it's taken me literally five to six years to get that point across. And it's still not being really adhered to because I don't know if it's a confidence issue or if it's an issue of just, you know, just, you know, just the normal people think that it's normal to be sore and, 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 and try to beat yourself up right. and, and not recover. The recovery is so important. And I had to learn that myself after seven, I say like six surgeries. When I allowed myself to recover, my performance improved, my mental outlook improved, everything improved from day one when I learned that recovery was the, more, the most important part. You, you just hit on an interesting point. So you get these people and they're lifting weights and then they suddenly reach this point where they're starting to burn out. Oh, yeah. They call it burning out, right? Yeah. And they're saying, shit, you know, I really don't feel like I want to go to the gym today. Yeah. They think that's psychological. Mm -hmm. That's not psychological. Yeah, that is the wearing down of their muscles and the mechanoreceptors in the joints and mm. the tent of the springs in the muscles sending yes. signals. Listen. You got to give us a break because you're going to hurt us. Mm -hmm. and we're here to let you know. I'm trying to provide you the symptoms to let you know we're not ready to get beaten up again. Exactly. It, it, it's always that premise. You don't listen to your body. Mm -hmm. You need to always listen to your body. Oh, yeah. Every day. If it's saying, if you're feeling something. It's there. There's, it, there's a reason for it. Exactly. Don't ignore it. Exactly. And that is a, uh, that that's at that. that that's what keeps, you know, that's what keeps people out of the gym yes. for long periods of time. I mean, for, 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 for consistent periods of time, I should say, that's why every January you'll see a horde of people in there from, for the first four weeks. By the middle of February, everybody's gone because they're beat up and they don't know how right. to actually manage their recovery. And right. I, and, and I, and I've actually added that part of my training into my training. And I, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to go deeper into it and really start the whole process of, of, of teaching people how to recover properly and how to do it in a way where it matches, you know, the, 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 the work output that they're actually, that they're actually doing, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's extremely important. So, so, you know, you did that battle workout. That's great. You caused the micro tears, but now Let's feed the muscle. Yes. Let's reduce our stress. Yes. Let's sleep right. Yes. Right. Let's give the muscle its greatest chance of healing back. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the great news is that when it heals back, you're going to be able to eventually lift that more that you're looking for. Exactly. You're going to begin to see your goals achieved of mm -hmm. increasing your weight, increasing your muscle mass. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to further your desire increase your confidence yes but if you break that cycle oh you're gonna you, you're gonna start feeling pain more often mm -hmm. your body's gonna be saying you're gonna wake up and it's gonna be saying you know what it's probably not today i don't think you should <laughs> go in and exactly you know you're, you're gonna start having a negative attitude about going to the gym which is exactly you're describing exactly why that January 1st thing where everybody says I'm going to do it fails. Oh, yeah. Because they go in too hard, too fast. Exactly. <laughs> you hit it exactly right. Yeah. And, and, and I've been fighting that battle because I try, I try to get people to understand that if you have a New Year's resolution, and I, you know, I don't really subscribe to that, you need to start in, in like September or October. <laughs> you need that's, to a start, yeah. that's a good idea that's a good idea i to like start, that idea yeah you, hey, start ahead of the game ease your way into it while you're enjoying the holiday season right develop the habit of, of of some sort of physical activity and then when january hits you are more apt to actually adhere yeah. to that behavior and yeah. you 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 exercise more consistently longer and you'll enjoy the process because there's not a bunch of pressure that's put on society on yeah, that whole New true. Year's resolution thing. So yeah. how does, do you, you know, and I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy cause I can get nerdy about this all day. Sure. When you, do you apply any, any uh, isometric movements where you're isolating and you're actually doing like, like time runner tension work 
where you're, you're where you where you have somebody hold a certain position for a certain amount of time in order to increase the uh the adaptation in in the strength within that muscle that needs to be strength uh, strengthened so um isometrics mm -hmm. that there, there's the three types of creating force mm -hmm. there's isometric iso isotonic and isokinetic mm -hmm. so isometric means no change in motion you're holding a position isotonic is the same resistance through it and isokinetic is the same speed mm -hmm. so the studies have shown that isotonic is the best way to create overall strength and that's okay. simply okay. because it's not the resistance that's creating the ability of the muscle to adapt it's the work it does mm -hmm. and the physics law for work is force times distance mm -hmm. so it's not just holding the resistance but it's making it go through the range of motion that the muscle can go through oh, wow. so that's why that has always been perceived okay now the other problem is with an isometric contraction, the greater overall force capacity could be developed. Mm -hmm. So because you're not going through range of motion, you could cause the muscle to create its greatest force, mm -hmm. not the most amount of work, but the greatest force. The problem with that is that they have shown that isometric types of contractions are where the highest tendency for strain exists. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So you don't want to do that in terms of if you're choosing to do this for growing strength, then isotonic is the answer. But let's say, and I'm not saying this is an, a, a typical thing, but let's say that you're going to be a bodybuilder. Yeah. And you're going to do a, a bodybuilding competition uh -huh. and you're going to hold a pose. Yeah. Well, that pose is isometric. Big time, yeah. And so- as you approach the show, my suggestion would be to stop the isotonic training, mm -hmm. say four to six weeks before, and begin to practice isometric training. And here's the reason why. That isometric contraction is going to develop lactic acid at a substantially faster rate than isotonic training. Mm -hmm. And the problem with lactic acid is it impedes the ability of a muscle to contract. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't conditioned yourself, and I've kind of seen it, it's a little scary to see the guy's holding that position. He's going to cramp out. Oh, he's yeah. going to have to come. He's just, he's got to put his arms down. Oh yeah. 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 You're just not going to be able to hold it. Mm -hmm. So for specific types of activities, if the activity incorporates, let's say you're in the army and one of the things that they want you to do is hold the gun over your head for as long as you can. Uh -huh. That's an isometric contraction. Yes, it is. So I would, if I was the person conditioning these individuals, would be develop deltoid strength through military press, post delts, yep. lateral, all those types of things. But then as we approach towards the end of when I want them ready for that, mm -hmm. again, I would switch them to different. So I would hold a dumbbell at this position for 30 seconds and then a minute and mm -hmm. then a minute and then I have to, and I would slowly try to progress that resistance slightly doing the isometric move because I now have to get my muscles to adapt to have living in a lactic acid environment mm -hmm. because sustained contraction is a lactic acid environment. Yes. So you just change your training for what you're trying to accomplish. Making muscle mass, is hands down isotonic using the same resistance conditioning for specific activities that warrant isometric types of contractions at towards the end start changing your training to, to isometric, isometric types training. of movements yeah. that that's what i would suggest. oh yeah it, it, and, it, and it makes sense because it's 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 specialized and it's it's and it's and it's made to adapt to the activity that the person is training person. for exactly. it, ma it makes a whole lot of sense you know, but, but so so, but it wouldn't it wouldn't increase the the, the chance of 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 healing that area or 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 or, or making that area stronger. So you know, you just uh, yeah, yeah. I I, I think that when we talk about healing, healing falls into the whole concept of oh, your yes. nutrition, mm -hmm. sleeping right. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought up in your book, which I think is critical. Oh my God, I don't think everybody understands this: the, the value of hydration. Oh, big time. Critical, Big critical. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't everybody recognize how important drinking water is uh, it, it, to the health of your muscle and everything else? Exactly. I, you know, I had this conversation with a client yesterday. She loves to drink sports drinks. 
And I told her the best hydration method is water. Your body is not made of sports drinks. Your body <laughs> is made of water. So you need to increase your water intake. And I, you know, if I can find a way to make water taste better to certain people, I, I would do it. I, you know, I, I used to tell people to, you know, add some crystal light into their right. water in right. order, you know, something that has limited caloric weight to it right. so they can actually drink and hydrate. That has been a battle. And I, I'm, I'm going to continue to fight that battle. Everyone that I train hears it on a daily basis. You need to hydrate. And that is why, and that's, that's why I put it in the book. I think it's great. I think it's critical to understand. So if you understand, if they could just have a little farther understanding about what a muscle is and how it works, they'll understand why the, the water is so critical. So a muscle basically is comprised of two proteins, actin and myosin, and the actin looks like a billion golf balls. Yep. And then the myosin looks like a billion golf clubs under an electron microscope. This yep. is really what a muscle looks like. So the way a muscle contracts is the golf club grabs the golf ball and pulls itself, grabs yep. the golf ball and pulls. Yep. So it looks like a billion golf clubs grabbing golf balls. And yep. the locations where that grabbing occurs is the way the muscle creates force. Yes. Well, obviously, there's going to be a lot, a lot of friction involved in these two fibers passing one another and pulling on one another. Don't you think having a good amount of lubrication would be helpful to limit the chance of straining? Exactly. Drink the water wow. for that purpose. If you plan on making muscle, drink the water. It's wow. going to help the muscles work better before you're doing it, during you're doing it, and after you're doing it. It's critical. Wow. I think it's a very, very important point that is just, I, it's so great to see somebody out there saying, listen, it's like as important as the weightlifting itself. It's, it's, Drink the water. Drink the water. And everyone that is listening to this podcast, especially if you're a client of mine or a potential client of mine, please listen to the doctor because he, he explained it in a, in, a, in a pure way. The muscles need water to actually grow and function properly. If you do not hydrate, your, you will minimize, you will minimize the benefit that you're getting from the stress that you're adding to the muscle while you're weightlifting, while you're running, Absolutely. while you're doing any kind of physical activity. You hit it on the head, Doc. I, I, I appreciate that. My, hey, kudos to you for you bringing it out, man, and being you. a, you know, you. A, a big proponent of it. That, that we need more people with these kind of. Listen, my attitude is that there's lots of people out there, and that, you know. People are slowly but showing healthcare is kind of imploding on itself and people are recognizing yes. that they're needing to take more and more responsibility for themselves. So they understand they don't have that information and they're looking for leaders. They're yes. looking for people that they can trust exactly. and can give them information that's viable, that exactly. makes sense, that is logically based. Exactly. So you should be happy and honored and, and, and be oh, proud yeah. that you're promoting some of these values that as far as I'm concerned, they're just not out there. It's all about pizzazz and oh, keeping it, you interested, even though it's really not going to help you. I got to <laughs> constantly be changing what you do because you're getting bored. You know what doesn't bore people? Success. Exactly. Success makes people very excited and stays very focused. Exactly. And that's my attitude. Exactly. I don't care if you're doing the same exercise for that bicep. When I get you to go from 10 pounds, the 50 pounds in that bicep curl and your muscle has blown up and you're doing everything you want. You're pain free. Trust me. They didn't mind the fact that they did the one exercise when all is said and done. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's a simple principle. It's the kiss method. Keep it simple. Stupid. Yes. Yes. You yes. have to keep it simple. And that, and that, that's a battle that I fight every day. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I try to make things as simple as possible without any kind of conjecture without any kind of fluff, without any kind of pizzazz. That's why I really my training method, it works, but it's not for everybody because I don't have people doing all these crazy uh, outlandish things. We work on movement per first and we load second. I could care less if I have a, a, a young kid that comes in here when he leaves and he's, if I'm, I'm on, and I'm, you know, privileged to train him for an extended period of time. If he leaves and, we're, and, and he's benching beyond a certain a maximum weight, that's his maximum weight. That's what's going to allow him to be more effective, not right. trying to get him up to a certain weight that just, you know, that, that turns into, a, 
you know, an ego, a ego contest where, you know, you're trying to get somebody to bench something that, you know, do something that, that they can't, they can't control. So simplicity is the actual, is the, is the, is the battle that we're, you know, people who talk sense, we're, we're both fighting. <laughs> so let, let's just kind of just extend that point, which is so critical for people, mm -hmm. especially for teenagers and 20 year olds or 30 year olds who are just getting into this. Let's just really make the point here. It is the technique that will make you grow, not the resistance. Very true. They, they, they have to understand this. If you do the technique correctly and you isolate the muscle, the muscle will respond by healing and growing and allowing you to make you be able to push more resistance. Exactly. If you think the absolute is moving the resistance, you are instantly going to compensate. Exactly. You're going to, when you're bench pressing, you're going to bring your butt off. Mm -hmm. You're going to jerk it up. You're going to bounce it off your chest. And all you're doing is trying to move a resistance that the individual muscle wasn't able to. Exactly. So the one time when you go back and try to do that perfect technique, you just strained yourself. Exactly. And you're the, there's a, there, there's, there's a, a way to keep the, the, the risk down. And that is to actually learn the movement. You know, Correct. and but you know, and and everybody wants this quick fix. Every off-season training program, I don't care what sport it is, unless it's you know, unless it's a, a you know a non-contact sport. The main objective is to get bigger. The main right. objective is to actually in, increase size. And everyone that I that I, and that's why I, I got out of the high school coaching for the most part is because there's a pressure to put kids in a stressful situation in efforts to get them to be bigger and stronger without a focus on movement, not under, not, with what, you know, which, which is, which is mind boggling to me, but that's why, you know, I, I try to reach the people that I'm supposed to reach that, that, that are willing to put in the time and the effort to consistently to build on a good foundation of movement. Yeah, I, I think that we have to be respectful of the coaches and those oh, yes. that are trying to push these people oh, and yeah. understand they're under pressure. Oh, big time. Right? Yeah. The yeah. schools are forcing these guys to say, oh, women, you got to win. You got to oh, yeah. win. You got to win. Oh, yeah. And so they have these lumps of clay and they're basically saying, we got to make you be big and everything yep. else and because I need to win. And yeah. You know, and, and the parent gets sucked into the oh, premise the because th there's always that allure of the scholarship and oh, the seeing yeah. my kid on there. I got it all. Oh, I yeah. got it all. I understand. But just as you're describing, if you're in the position to be working with a kid or, you know, a teenager or a young person, you know, in their 20s, it's your responsibility. Yes, it is. To make sure that everything is safe. Before time. all, prevent injury. Exactly. And make them understand the life lessons that mm -hmm. are gained from weightlifting. I've been lifting weights for 35 years. Mm -hmm. 35 years, man. Mm -hmm. I have never stopped. I have progressively grown. I have never plateaued in my weightlifting. Never, never. Wow. 35 years, I have never plateaued because my techniques are so pure yep. and I simply focus on my techniques mm -hmm. and allow the muscle to grow as it is capable of it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's the key. And, and I hate to say it, man, and you're right on it, man. Take the ego out of weightlifting. <sighs> it, it makes no sense. And it puts people in a position where they, they, they're, they're, they're exposing themselves to injury in a, for, for, for nothing. And, you know, and, and just to go back, you know, the, the, you know, I know a lot of coaches have limited resources and limited time and that pressure puts them in a position where they put kids at risk. Cause I've seen some things on Instagram. Uh, it, it's kind of quieted down now, but like five or six years ago, it'd be nothing to see, seeing a kid pushing weight and look like they're going to bust their back and uh, they have limited control of the weight and, I don't know if the kid is injured or not, but I know they never tried that weight again. So, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a lesson that in a message that I get, try to get out. I try to get to everyone, you know, the ones who want to listen, hopefully they are, they're listening, the, but you know, the ones that don't want to listen, hopefully you learn 
to actually nurture a kid's experience and, and really put it in perspective that this is a long-term deal when it comes to kids learning how to act, kids and really young adults learning yeah. how to, you know, how to, how to uh, train properly. I, I, I certainly hope they listen to you yeah. because your life experience is in many ways what they're looking to uh, raise to, to rise to. And so, I mean, you've already been there. And, and, and so I would hope that not just the kids, but their parents would yeah. listen to you and say, listen, the guy's got the experience. He has the life experience. Yeah, He's talking from his past. And so listen to it. Oh, listen yeah. to what he's saying. The, you know, this guy's been there yeah. and he's gone through the process. He's got the experience. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the person you want to listen to. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and that, you know, I've been lucky enough to where, where I, you know, where I have had some success with, with you know, with a number of kids. I just, you know, I want to, and really a young number of, of, of adults also that really have learned how to actually take care of their bodies and, and, and train properly and, and, and really focus on movement. And that's, you know, that's me in a nutshell. I teach people how to move better. That's, that's great. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty much the gist of what I do. And, you know, I try to push that message along. So, you know, what, what you know, moving forward, what do you have going on in the future? Um, do you have any any upcoming events or any kind of um, any kind of literature that you're that you're that you're um, that you're um, coming out with? So, in terms of um, how I create awareness of the method, mm -hmm. there is my website livewithoutpains.com. It's plural, livewithoutpains.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's testimonials. There's information mm -hmm. about the method. But certainly, to me, the best way of getting the information is through my YouTube channel, you Dr. Go. Mitchell Yas. There's probably over 200 videos now. Um, I, I try to break the videos up into um, specific injuries. People have specific joints, mm -hmm. misnomers about how diagnoses are achieved, all this type of stuff. And it's kind of scientific, broken down to the layperson. I only mm -hmm. speak in laypersonese. I don't use technical words or anything because oh, I don't yeah. see any point in that. Um, but so there's Dr. Mitchell's Facebook page, the Yas Method, the Instagram page, live underscore without underscore pains. Um, and, and I think the best thing that people can understand is that they can get the method virtually. That is, to me, the most important thing. You do not have to see me in person. If you're having pain, if you're having dysfunction, you're fed up yes. with going to the medical system. And maybe frustration or hopelessness or depression has kind mm -hmm. of lurked in, you know, it's happening not because they'll try to convince you. People try to convince people that those those uh, emotions are attached to the pain. It's not the pain. Mm -hmm. There is no direct connection neurologically from the same the pain center of the brain to the emotional section of the brain. Imagine if there was every time you got a pay, paper cut, you'd have a you'd have a nervous breakdown, right? Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's not true. <laughs> what it is is the fact that time is going on mm -hmm. and your pain is not being resolved. Mm -hmm. So you're beginning to sense that this is your life. This is what life is going to be going forward, mm -hmm. maybe indefinitely. That's what brings on the emotion. So if you've reached there, well, by all means, look to an alternative approach. Look mm -hmm. to something that sounds a lot different than what you've had, mm -hmm. right? You know, Einstein said doing the same thing and expecting a different result is the is definition insane. of insanity, right? Yes, well, sir. Don't, don't go insane, my friends. <laughs> Look for something different. And this is completely different and it is outside the medical system. And I'm telling you that in more than 98% of cases, your pain is muscular and that's mm -hmm. not gonna be identified through the medical system. So recognize you can get this method through Zoom. The sessions of videotape, which is another awesome aspect. Mm -hmm. So you take that going forward. That's how you know how to do your exercises correctly and how to progress your uh, resistances correctly. And again, you can schedule your sessions at livewithoutpains.com. So that, that's my message to everybody. There's just plenty of reference information out there. I've written three books, Overpower that's Pain, The Pain Cure Rx, and The Yas Method for Pain-Free Movement. If you want to read books, you have that. Um, what we're thinking is that I've only recently begun this quest to create awareness. I've been doing this for 28 years, uh -huh. and I was completely focused on the science but oh, now yeah. there's a push to create awareness of this because there's such desperation so i'm trying to become guests on podcasts which Dang. obviously you were nice enough to allow me to be on Man. and um 
we're just trying to reach as many people. And hopefully once we get that, we're going to start certifying people to become Zoom uh, method practitioners. And we're going to get this out there and, and grow. That is huge. And we're going to have all of Dr. Yaz's information on in the show notes. I'm going to I'm going to really push this on every every area of social media that, that I have as far as with Atlas. And, and we're, we're going to help you get this, uh, get, the, get the word out and get as many people involved in this as possible because you hit it on the head. Um, I, 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 my, my girlfriend is in the nurse. She, she's, she's, she's actually in the, um, in the healthcare field and there is a implosion of within the health and within the medical field that people are looking for true answers that go beyond just, you know, giving them a pill and a shot. Absolutely. People are looking for those answers. People are looking for, 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 for those, 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 those answers to those questions that they have that makes sense, that is simple to the point that involves them being more active. Ultimately, what is the YAS method in a phrase? It's an ability for people to reclaim their lives by empowering them to address the cause of their pain. That's really what it is. That is huge. I, I guess on that note, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna sign off. And Doctor, I would I'm going I would love to have you back on to talk about because this this is an expansive subject and this 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 touches every aspect of human development. I don't care what age you're, you, what age, how old you are. You know, I, I would love to have you back to talk to, to, to talk about a couple other subjects. You know, that oh, absolutely. You know, it would be my honor. I love yeah. it. It's great talking to you, man. Oh, no you're, 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 you're in there. You're a fighter. You're out there doing the right thing. So yeah. I really believe we all, have, we're the ones who have to band together, man. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. We, hey. we got, we got to create a bigger presence than the medical establishment and, and doing that. We're going to overtake it, man. I really do believe that. Exactly. And help more people live with a purpose without any yes. restrictions on yes. themselves physically. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us in the Game Ready Podcast. This has probably been one. I, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed this. This has been very informative. You guys have any questions, any comments, please, please leave them in the comment section, section below. And we'll talk to you guys soon live with a purpose and, and hopefully you can train with a purpose.